morning, everyone. Um, good to see you all. I hope you have a great week. Uh, let us uh, worship together. I'm going to read Acts chapter 13, 42 to 52. Uh, if you pause your video and open your book, I'm going to read for you. As Paul and Barnabas were living in the synagogue, the people invite them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout uh, converts to the Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. Uh, they began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first, since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. We now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light, light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. And all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole uh, reason, but the Jewish leaders incited the God fearing women of the high standing and the leading the men of the city. They stirred up persecution against the Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the, their region. Uh, so uh, they shook the dust of their feet as a warning to them and went to uh, Iconium. And the disciples were filled with the joy and with the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful uh, the moment you give us uh, worship and listen to you, Lord. Uh, make us ready to receive your uh, blessing, word of God. Uh, be uh, with us, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The book of Acts is uh, uh, largely uh, divided into two parts. The first half is uh, chapters 1 to 12, which is about the beginning of the church era uh, uh, with the advent of the Holy Spirit. The second half is uh, chapters 13 to 28, which is about the beginning of the ma mission era with the work of the Holy Spirit. So now we are living uh, in the church era and the missions era. The second uh, half of Acts, Acts about the beginning of the mission era is basically a description of the Paul's first, second, and third missionary journeys. Uh, in the first missionary journey, the gospel spread from the Jews to Gentiles. And in the second missionary journey, the gospel spread from Asia to Europe. The third uh, missionary journey was uh, strengthened the churches he had planted already previously. Today's passage is about Paul's first missionary journey, uh, which shows how the gospel spreads from the Jews to Gentiles. This is a historical moment especially in the kingdom of God. You may not be very impressed by this, but let me tell you, without the gospel spreading from the Jews to Gentiles, you and I could not believe in Jesus and be saved because we are the Gentiles. The book, uh, Guns and Germs and, and Steel, Gone, Germs and Steel, The Fate of the Human Societies, written by Jared Diamond, won the Pulitzer Prize in the 1998. 
1998, Diamond writes how development and spreading of guns, germs, and steel have changed the history of humanity. However, the spreading of the gospel to the Gentiles brought greater changes to history than guns, germs, and steel. If you cannot see the great in impact of the gospels spreading to the Gentiles in history, think of all non-Jewish Christians you know in history. Or also, think of you and me. If the gospel didn't spread to Gentiles, the gospel could not have spread to America and Korea. And we, could, we couldn't have believed in Jesus and be saved, been saved. So this spreading of gospel from the Jews to Gentiles is a historical event and so important to us as non-Jewish Christians. So then how did this historical event come out? How did the gospel pass from the Jews to Gentiles? Who brought this change? Let's read verse 42, uh, 47 together. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. This was a quote from Isaiah 49 to 6. It wasn't Paul's plan. It wasn't uh, Banab's choice. But that doesn't mean that it just happened. No, it wasn't surrendered pity. Surrendered pity, uh, it was God's predestination, God's choice. As Paul and Barnabas preached the gospel to the Gentiles for the first time, they realized that this was not just a lucky coincidence uh, that Gentiles accepted the gospel in joy, but it was God's predestination and choice as a prophesied in, the, in Isaiah 49-6 in the Old Testament. And also Paul realized that it was the fulfillment of the, what Lord had uh, said to Ananias who came and placed his hand on the blind Paul to restore his sight. Uh, this man is the, uh, my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. So Paul was uh, convinced that this was a God's predestination, God's choice. There are other three stages of faith. For, uh, in the first stage, you know that God is alive. In the second stage, we receive God's love and work of salvation. We believe that God so loved the world and sent His Son to die on the cross that you and I are the world God so loved. Finally, in the third and last stage, we're living according to God's will in this world, following Jesus and His words. It is God's predestination and choice that is strongly applied in all three cases. How? A group of people listen to the same word of God, but some acknowledge and believe that God is alive, but others don't. It's not like those who acknowledge that God is alive have a sixth, sixth sense or an additional brain part or organ for the recognizing God. It's not intelligence or level of education that makes a difference either. How can some people believe that Jesus Christ died for them? Sometimes it's hard to even believe what the person next to me is saying. But how it is, it, it, is it some uh, could believe that what happened 2,000 years ago is related to their salvation? How can some have a desire to live a life that pleases God? A couple can sleep in the same bed, but one can hear God's voice, understand God's will, but the other doesn't. Some have, uh, er, er, uh, some have a hard time praying for the even five or ten minutes, 
but some can pray at least two or three hours non-stop. Based on all of this, we cannot help but say that it is God's predestination that He elected to save some to save. We do not know everything about God's predestination, but today's passage tells us important inf information about this. The clues are in what Paul and Barnabas said, said to the Jew who rejected the gospel and contradicted Paul. Let's read verse uh, 46 together. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, we had to speak the word of God to you first, since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. We now turn to Gentiles. What did the Jews reject? It was the word of God. Uh, a week before this, as a God's messenger, Paul gave a great sermon in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, explaining God's providence and promise in the history of Israel and clearly proclaim the gospel at the end. Let's read verse 38 to 39. Therefore, my friends, I want to know that through Jesus Christ, uh, through Jesus, the forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Paul clearly uh, told everyone that the forgiveness of sin is offered through Jesus and everyone who believes Jesus is set free from every sin. This kind of freedom was not offered under the law of Moses, but now it is being offered as a gift from God in His grace. But when the Jew rejected the offer of a, uh, offer of a gift from God, they made themselves unworthy of the eternal life. In another translation, rejected was translated as a thrust it aside. The Jews decided that their Jewish heritage qualified them for eternal life out of pride. That's why they thrust aside uh, it, this gift of the forgiveness of sins. However, it's not just they rejected God's gift that they were not saved. In another uh, other words, in other words, it was not based on based on their decision, but rather it's because they were not elected by God that they rejected the gospel and thrust it aside. On the other hand. Let's look at the Gentiles' reaction in verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of God, word of Lord, and, and, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. Unlike the Jews, uh, when Gentiles heard the God, uh, word of God's offer of the forgiveness of sins through Jesus, they were glad and they honored the word of the Lord. Why? Because they were appointed, which means elected for eternal life by God. The Gentiles' appointment to eternal life was not the result of their believing. Rather, the believing is uh, the result or uh, uh, effect of the divine appointment. In other words, because the Gentiles were elected by God. They showed such a reaction of the rejoicing and honoring uh, the word of God. The unconditional election of God comes first. Then the uh, result is the elected believing. The Bible clearly tells us about God's election in many passages. Let us read John 10, 26 to 27. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Second Thessalonians chapter two thirteen. Uh, but you ought always to think, thank God for you, for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because you, uh, God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying 
work of the Holy Spirit, work of the Spirit, and through believe in the truth. Romans chapter 9, 10 to 6, 16. Not only that, but Rebecca's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet, uh, before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls. She, she was told, the, old, the, old, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Jesus I hated. Uh, what then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he, he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or uh, effort, but on God's mercy. In Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, 8-9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Based on all these scriptures and today's passage, our salvation and faith are absolutely the result of God's election. It's not because we show the faith that God chose us. It's because God elected us in the grace that we are saved. Yes, we are saved through our faith, but even this faith was not uh, from ourselves, but it was the gift of God. There, are, uh, there was uh, no work on our part at all to be chosen by God. Some may say uh, that it's, it's not fair for God to save someone but not others. But without God's election to save some, all had to perish in our, in our sins. sins. So, so we cannot say God is unfair or unjust for saving some uh, out of a destruction of all. At least it's not our place to say for those who are elected for the eternal life. Why does God elect some but not others? Honestly, we don't know everything. But the uh, following verses give us the hint. Let us read uh, Romans chapter 9, 22, 23. What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make your power to known, bore, bore with a great patience with the uh, object of his wrath, prepared for the destruction. What if he did, he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the object of his mercy, uh, whom he prepared in advance for glory? These verses started the what if, but God has already for with a great patience, the object of rest prepared for destruction. Although verses 22 sounds like a hypothetical uh, question, it is actually God's decision to bear with the object of his rest with a great patience, uh, which is what he has been doing since the fall of man. This suggests that the reasoning in the verse 23 could be true, that God is saving some to make the riches of His glory known to the objects of His mercy us. So far, we have learned that God's election is unconditional, so He freely chooses whomever He wants to save, and that He may be doing this to make the riches of His glory and known to us, uh, the object of the, His mercy. Then, what uh, effect does God unconditional elect have on us when we truly realize it? First, humility. Uh, we fall down, uh, we fall down uh, on our knees and bow down to God in humility and strip off all boasting 
as, uh, as in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 to 9, our salvation, even our faith, were, were uh, the gifts of God. Uh, there is uh, nothing we have done that has uh, affected uh, our salvation or faith even in the slight, uh, slightest way. Thus, our faith and salvation are entirely owing to God's grace. Let us read Ephesians chapter 8 to 9 again. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Uh, and the second my point is the thankfulness. Uh, so what else can we say and do for God's grace? Uh, but be careful, uh, be thankful, and He elected us. And um, we don't know why, but we are thankful that we are rescued from the sen uh, sentencing ourselves to death and hell. Uh, like the Jews, if we were not elected, we wouldn't uh, thrust it, the gospel aside, giving ourselves the death sentences. Thankfulness along, uh, along with uh, humility should be the foundation of attitude of all believers who are the object of mercy. We receive the gifts of salvation and faith. And third point is very important because this is the how we uh, react for thankfulness and then humility. Uh, my third point is have hope for others. When we know God's unconditional election, if you really truly know God's election, and um, we have hope that uh, God's unconditional love and election can reach even the worst sinner. Uh, when we know this, we can let go of our uh, prejudice, this, uh, prejudice this and judgment on people and simply share the gospel with the hope that God's unconditional election will work through our sharing. Uh, in this business of saving souls, we are in a partnership with God. God does the electing and saving souls and we, as his messengers, speak and proclaim the gospel. As we share the gospel, we simply get to know who are elected by seeing who believes. Thus, we must spread the gospel to whomever without judging and deciding who may seem worthy to be elected. Because the electing and choosing is entirely at God's work. So even for those who reject the gospel after hearing it for the first time, we must not lose hope in that they may change at the second and uh, subsequent, uh, subsequent hearing of gospel. Actually, we don't know who is the saved one. Second Timothy uh, chapter 2, 24 to 26 teaches us that let us read together. And the Lord's the servant must be, must not be quarrelsome. Uh, some must be kind to everyone, uh, able to teach, not resentful. Uh, opponents must be uh, gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth. And that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of devil, trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. These verses teach us uh, that teach us not to give up when people oppose the gospel, but to gently instruct and have hope that God may grant them repentance, leading them to to a knowledge of truth. This suggests that God's election may not happen after the first time hearing the gospel, which is why we must be patient and not lose hope in repeating God's message for salvation and continue to reach out to all people. Uh, we are elected by God. The Bible tells us that God wants 
wants, uh, wants to make the riches of His glory known to us. Those who are elected by His grace, mercy, uh, grace and mercy. We don't understand everything, but as we have experienced the riches of His glory and mercy, we should be humble and thankful and have hope for others. Have, have hope for others is so important. As God unconditional love elected us, same as He can elect this, uh, the uh, worst sinner, which give us hope to, in others and con, uh, confidence in what we share with them. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, uh, thank, uh, thank you for uh, electing us and making us the object of the mercy. Uh, although we don't deserve any of this, uh, there are times that we forget that and grumbles and complaints fill our lives rather than humility and thankfulness. It's your unconditional love that elected us. Let us have hope in others that your unconditional love will continue to elect some to save them from eternal destruction. Help us have a firm conviction that what we are sharing is the life-saving power with those who are accepted with rejoicing. And help us to continue to reach out to everyone around us continuously without giving up when some don't accept our message the first time. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to read a question for meditation. First, why is the second half, half of Acts about the beginning of the mission era with the work of the Holy Spirit important to us? Second, what is our part or contribution in God's election? If God el God's election is the entire God's choice, what are the three effects God's unconditional election has on us when we truly realize it? Third, when we know that God's unconditional election can save even the worst sinner, how does our attitude change in evangelizing others when you face really tough you know, people? Um, I'm going to bless you. May the grace of Jesus Christ and love of God the Father uh, and the Holy Spirit of the uh, fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you uh, now and forever. Amen. Have a good week. See you. Ho uh, hopefully you see you at church. Bye.